Hey, what is going on, guys? This is Tabmock99, and with me is David L. Craddock, the author of Arcade Perfect. David, how you doing? I'm doing so well, man, and I've been looking forward to this. Thank you very much for having me on. Hey, me too. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. So um, I'm really excited to get into the book. It's it's. I have a copy right here, actually. Arcade Perfect, How Pac-Man, Mortal Kombat, and Other Coin-Op Releases Invaded the Living Room. So, great title. Um, it kind of really is a good hint at what the book is about. Uh, because, yeah. you know, there's a lot of things said about the arcade days, and a lot of people are nostalgic great to kind of talk uh, about that stuff. Really... But you, you specifically focus on the niche market of those retro games coming out for the home consoles. They were arcade games. Then they had to be ported, and now you can play them in your living room. So I think that's a great area to focus on. What made you think of this? Um, there were a few things. So I love writing about retro games, games from the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, sometimes even older. The problem is, is that since the retro scene is so big, you can find any number of journalists, authors, YouTubers, Twitch streamers, etc. that kind of cover that ground. And so when I write about... Um, a very common and popular area like arcade games, I always look for an angle that either hasn't been explored at all, which is very rare, or that at least hasn't been explored from an angle at which I want to explore it. Um, which brings me to reason number two. As a kid, and I think you can relate to this, a lot of people from our generation, um, as much as I loved arcade games such as Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter, Ninja Turtles, Golden Axe, I probably had more playtime on the home versions because, you know, once you get those, the years for keeps. You don't have to bug mom and dad for quarters every time you go to the mall or your local pizzeria. Um, and so as a kid, you know, I, I was old enough to participate in the console war. I had a friend who had Genesis. I was and, and still am kind of firmly in the Nintendo camp. But, you know, he got me when he got Mortal Kombat 1. He's like, I have the blood code. I'm like, all right, you win. I can't even, I have nothing to say. Can't compete with that. But as I got older, I was kind of less interested in, in the tribalism of which version is better and more interested in, you know, if these are both 16-bit platforms and Mortal Kombat is the same, why do they look different? Why do they sound different? Why do they play different? Um, and as I got older, I do have some programming experience, but uh, as I became a writer, which I do full time, um, I kind of made it my goal to write stories that uh, are narrative driven, so they read like a novel, but also kind of get kind of lets you peek behind the curtain to see what the wizards are doing back there. And so I wanted to write a full book about arcade ports, um, especially for consoles, I would say PlayStation or earlier, when your odds of getting the, the quote-unquote arcade perfect port were very slim because console hardware was just not up to par with arcade hardware and, and learn about just what these developers had to do to make these classic games work at home. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a fascinating thing. Um, you know, my first experience with Mortal Kombat was actually on a friend's Sega Genesis console. So then right. later, I got the Super Nintendo version, which, yeah, it didn't have the blood, but it was good enough for me. And then yeah. after that, I started getting good and, and going to the arcades. And I know that's something that you talk about in the book. Um, so before we get into it, um, I'm not going to give everything away in the book. Obviously, I want people to have a good reason to buy it. So there's going to be certain things that we're going to leave, and uh, the readers will have to suss that stuff out for themselves. But you do right. go all out. I mean, you actually track down the programmers from Sculptured Software, from Probe. You get the hands-on. You go, like, really deep in a way that most people don't. Because most people, we all know, like, how the story of how Mortal Kombat came to be. We know the arcade developers. Yeah. What gets lost in translation is... How did those home ports come to life? And I love it. And um, even though the book is not Mortal Kombat centric, you do have two chapters. You have one on Mortal Kombat. You have one on Mortal Kombat 2. I don't think there's any other franchise that gets two chapters in your book. Plus, it gets a mention on the title. And you've got a screenshot of the game on the title. So I can see clearly you are a Mortal Kombat fan. Oh, so I'm more than a fan. Mortal Kombat actually got me... Uh, my first writing job. So when I was a kid, Mortal Kombat came out at arcades in, what, 92. I was a little over 10. And my mom was one of the cool parents. She let me play these violent games as long as I wasn't running around at school being like, hold still, let me see if I can rip your head off. You know, just all the kids, don't try this at home. I listened to that. I took that to heart. Um, but she was also cool because when the game came out and I couldn't, you know, when I wasn't at the arcade to play it, I wanted to... To just, I was just thinking about it all the time. So when I found a strategy guide at Walden Books, she bought it for me. And I had kids. I would take it to school and read during class, of course. 
And uh, I had kids saying, oh, let me borrow your guide. And I was like, you can't borrow this, man. This is my only copy. But what I did was I went into our school's computer lab. We had a bunch of Macs. I typed up everybody's special moves, fatality, well, fatality singular from Mortal Kombat 1. I printed off a bunch of copies, and I would charge people a quarter a pop. So that was my first published writing job, just completely flagrantly ripping off the strategy guides. And I actually... I became, I got such a reputation as a Mortal Kombat fan that around middle school and high school, I was actually known as Mortal. And not just by friends. I would have, I remember my algebra teacher saying, hey, Mortal, pass up your homework. Because I probably had my nose in a Mortal Kombat strategy. Well, that's funny because I used to be known as Combat. Well, see? So, oh, Mortal and Combat together. Last, we're like we're like Noob and Cybot Boone and Tobias here. Exactly. In fact, the name that I go by now is Tabmock99. It's still Combat, just backwards. That, oh, see, yeah, you're living, you're living the gimmick, man. I love it. You got to man. You got to So, all right. I'm glad you talked about your career because I did want to talk to you personally, um, you know, about your biography and so forth before we really delve deep into the book. Um, you actually have a pretty big writing career. You've written for a lot of magazines, a lot of press, and you have a lot of other books. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So, um, really, I loved games, and I wanted to do something game-focused with my career. Um, because my mom said, you know, she, she kind of tolerated my gaming habit, but she said, you know, if you're going to play these games, at least one day make sure that you can make money off of them. Otherwise, you know, you should be studying. And I said, all right, well, I want to be a programmer. And I've actually been programming off and on since I was nine. But I would take like 18 credit hours worth of computer science courses in college, and then a, a lit and or writing course, sometimes one or uh, two or three, just to kind of relax. I like to be busy, but writing was really relaxing. And as I got into it, I realized that I really enjoyed writing stories more than I enjoyed writing code. One's a logic puzzle. One is really more about storytelling, and that's what I love to do. Um, so I, I started out writing pro bono for a, a now defunct website called mygamer.com. I got paid in games. They would say, hey, we need a preview. If you want to do this, I'll send you the game. And I said, sure, because as a gamer, you know, you want to play all sorts of things. And so this was really uh, my chance to otherwise, you know, play experience games that I might not otherwise get to play. And who could say no to free uh, games? I mean, come on. No, yeah, who's, who's going to do that, right? Um, and then I kind of moved into actually getting, uh, writing words in exchange for a paycheck. I started at shacknews.com. Uh, did freelance for a while. Technically, I'm still doing freelance. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I do write full time between books and articles. Uh, I make um, you know enough to to earn a living, and, and um, do, it, it's really important to me to write for my day job because I think, especially if you want to do anything creative, be it graphic design, writing, anything. Writing for clients gives you an opportunity to kind of adhere to their styles and requirements and kind of push yourself to to write in different ways, ways you might not have, have thought of if you hadn't, you know, been told, hey, this is our this is our voice, this is our style, you need to match it. Um, and uh, you know, eventually one thing you and I talked about, I think, before we went live is when I when I write these stories. Uh, I like to look for different angles. Now we did we talked about that just a few minutes ago, and part of that is you know you mentioned I, I talked to a lot of programmers and artists and so forth from Sculptured Probe and other companies. One of the reasons for that is I feel like there are a lot of books out there for retro games that kind of just regurgitate Wikipedia. Um, I like to get firsthand quotes, and as I started doing that in interviews and in retrospectives for sites like GoodOldGames.com, GOG.com. Um, I realized, you know, what I really like to write about is I love to tell the stories of how games were made kind of in the good old days in the Wild West. And, and the reason is, you know, these days at a company like Ubisoft, Electronic Arts, Activision, Blizzard, development teams number in the hundreds. Whereas look at Mortal Kombat 1. That was made by four people. So you know that all four of those people had a really big footprint on the game. You can kind of see their personalities coming on. That's something kind of as an aside that maybe you'll agree has always been cool about Mortal Kombat. They throw in little stuff like Dan Ford and the sound guy popping in just to say toasty. Like he's not part of the lore. He's just, you get to know these people by seeing their face and knowing, Oh, that's who that is. It's kind of cool that he just pops up when I do an uppercut. Yeah. Um, and then stuff was, like their names appears on the tombstones in the cemetery yeah, background yeah. in Mortal Kombat three. Yeah. Like we love that yeah. stuff. Those kind of Easter think, eggs. Yeah. I think it was, uh, is it John Tobias's head is also impaled in the pit of Mortal Kombat one. I think that's 
Booms or Tobias's head is, is one of them. Ed Boom's entire body is like back there too. Is that it? Okay, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I forgot about that. But yeah, and you can only see it like if you happen to uppercut him at the right part of the screen because if you're too off to the side, you'll miss it. Um, so yeah, right, like really, right. really great hidden stuff there. Right. So uh, as I just started doing more of those interviews, I kind of just pivoted in that direction or I guess not pivoted but really leaned into it I I, I went from writing retrospectives to my breakout book uh, figuratively I actually do have a book called Breakout about the history of Apple II games but my first big hit was Stay Well and Listen Book 1 which is of course about Diablo and Blizzard um, and that's actually what I was working on before uh, we talked today I'm doing final revisions on Stay Well and Listen Book 2 which will be out in the next couple of months um, I'm just really kind of hone my craft to write these narrative driven stories and with arcade perfect there are a lot of scenes in there that do feel like you're watching a movie a lot of conversations between people um, i'm kind of going more in that direction just to pull you as into the story as i can get you without you actually having been there yeah no and it's perfect i mean it really does feel like uh, i can identify and i can understand the particular challenges that arose at companies like probe and sculptured software um, which are not stories that you can find on Wikipedia. These are not things I've ever heard before, and I follow Mortal Kombat religiously. I have all the magazines, and I have like every book about it ever written, and some of the stuff I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. So you did a really good job, and I think all Mortal Kombat fans should get a copy of this book. Now, if you want to do it right now, you can actually do so at the address below. If you use that address, that helps me out, and of course it helps you out. Um, but I would save it to the end of the stream, because we actually have a signed copy David Craddock signed this himself, and we are giving it away at the end of the stream. So hang on, and if you make it to the end, you will have a chance to win your copy. So I wanted to ask you, uh, David, about this thing called Story Bundle. Because Story Bundle yes. was kind of how I first became aware of your book in the peripheral, <laughs> uh, my peripheral vision there. I said, hey, I don't know exactly what this is, but I see there's a book here called Arcade Perfect. Uh, I don't know if I can get like 10 books but I do want to circle back to this one. What is Story Bundle? How did this come about, and how did you get connected to it? Sure. I've been involved in Story Bundle for the last few years. Uh, for the last few years, I'm sure a lot of your um, your fans know about Humble Bundle, kind of a pay-what-you-want collection of games, and they do books as well. Story Bundle is kind of the same thing. It's a pay-what-you-want bundle of books under different themes, and it targets indie authors. You know, I've done, I've done some traditional publishing, um, but... For, for indie authors and their books such as Arcade Perfect, this is um, a collection of books where you can pay. I think it's usually $5 minimum. You get a few, 15 or more, and you get the whole lot. And uh, I went from contributing books in that to actually I'm now a curator for Story Bundle. I'm the guy in charge of selecting books that will be in the gaming bundles. In fact, as of October 30th, just a few weeks away, we'll be doing our next gaming bundle. So you might want to look forward to that. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, it's, you know, you can go on storybundle.com at any time. There's also, I think, at least two, sometimes three bundles. They do sci-fi bundles, fantasy. Um, you know, November is a NaNoWriMo month, so there are, um, like, I think last year they did a collection of books about, hey, here's how to write a book in a month if you want to do the National Novel Writing Month Challenge. Um, so we do all such stuff over there. And RK Perfect first appeared in Story Bundle over July, and then uh, it took a couple months off, and then I released it in full on September 13th, which, as you know, was the uh, 26th anniversary, 27th anniversary of Mortal Monday. Yes, absolutely. Um, so let me ask you this then. If I had, or if, I, if anybody had gotten, uh, taken advantage of that story bundle, would they have gotten the full access to Arcade Perfect back in July? Yes, absolutely. Um, the only thing about Arcade Perfect that changed was it was ready to go. It was completely finished when I put it in the story bundle. But since I had about, I don't know, a month and a half, two months before the full release, I decided to go back through it and clean it up a little bit more. You know, that you can always do another revision, clean up things you probably missed yep. uh, here. And so, but, you know, if you got it in the story bundle, you're not missing anything. Oh, okay. All right. Real Sub Zero has a question. How, does the, sure. how much does the book sell for? If I'm not mistaken, I think I know. It's $30. U.S. Correct. for the paperback and Correct. then nine ninety nine for the Kindle edition. Yes, and I I believe I I got an email as an indie publisher. Uh, Amazon said they're doing away with a program called Matchbook soon, which is 
it's kind of a cool thing and it should still be in effect for a couple more weeks but when you buy a hard copy edition of a book if the author chooses or the publisher chooses you can get the digital kindle edition for a little cheaper yeah so I, believe, I remember that yeah. yes yeah so i believe right now if you decide to to spring for the 30 dollar paperback you can get the kindle copy for like three dollars instead of ten. Oh, yeah that's a good deal so yeah. they're doing away with that well that is a shame that is a and they shame. Didn't, it, it's Amazon. You know, they don't cancel stuff as often as Google does, but they really don't offer any explanation. They just said, hey, this is going to go out of service in a couple months, so okay, bye. Well, you know, at so least they give like, you a heads up, right? Yeah, at least they have a heads up, yeah. Okay, so um, we were talking a little bit more about Easter eggs. Um, before I get into the Mortal Kombat stuff, I did want to go over a couple of my other favorite games. So this is the Mortal Kombat channel. Uh, what I do here is I go ridiculous into the backstory or... You know, not necessarily that, but like behind the scenes stuff or any just random trivia thing. We like to take the obscure and make it skewer. So, <laughs> be but, uh, so before we get to the Mortal Kombat, I want to talk about Space Invaders. Um, in your book, I, there was yes. something that had somehow escaped my attention, but there was a, there was like a indie programmer who made a game called In Plus for Atari. Yes. And he actually went and he made a working, um, functional copy and it would actually right. run on an Atari 2600 cartridge if you were to take the ROM and burn it to one and there are companies doing that um, so I just want to play a quick clip of in plus because you mentioned an Easter egg and what you have to do in order to make this Easter egg work is you have to wait for the mothership to come by and your first yes. bullet in the game that you fire has to hit it and I actually <laughs> was so intrigued when I read that part I had to do it so let's play that yeah I want to see this Cut the tension with a knife. Hey, <laughs> that's what happens. Uh, so I guess you're watching it on a little bit of a delay. Yes. <laughs> I just saw it. Nice shot. Yeah, it's amazing. And that, of course, happens to be the initials of the programmer. So I thought that yes. was like a really cool thing. <laughs> uh, all right. So that was my Space Invaders question for you. Um, let's switch over to an audience member, MNSZ. Oh, I'm sure the SZ stands for Sub-Zero. I don't know what the MN stands for. Um, he wants to know what you're drinking. Uh, I'm drinking water, but I get these. My wife orders these, these fizzy tabs uh, for hydration, different flavors. So you can drop one in a tablet, it, it fizzes, and then it flavors the water. I try to drink a lot of water. I'm at my computer all day writing, so I like to stay hydrated. But water itself is boring, so when I have these added flavors, it's something to change things up a little. Oh, well, what flavor do you have it added to it? This is lime, which oh, is okay. Good it stuff. It tastes like cough medicine or something, but it's all right. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Um, now I've got a Pac-Man related question for you. All right. All right. Pac-Man was one of those games that uh, for the Atari 2600, it was very different from the arcade version. Now, to be fair, I thought the Pac I thought the Atari version was cool. Like, yeah, it's not the same as the arcade. It's a different game. But I don't think they could have gotten away with calling it something else. It's definitely a Pac-Man game. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, if you watch Superman 3, that scene where, like, Superman is destroying that supercomputer, that supercomputer is making Atari Pac-Man sounds. <laughs> you can actually hear the sound effects from the Pac-Man game right in there. And that's supposed to be, like, this, you know, the most amazing supercomputer ever built. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty cool. Yeah, so, all right, this is my question for you. Um, about a year or two ago, Atari came out with this device. This is an Atari Flashback Portable. And it has Pac-Man preloaded, but it is not the Atari 2600 Pac-Man. It's actually a lot closer uh, to the arcade version. And I'm going to play a clip of that so everybody can kind of see what I'm talking about here. Oh yeah, that's 
Uh, the goat, everything's still flickering like mad, though. But yeah, graphically, it's definitely a lot closer. Yeah, and the sounds, too. Yeah, it flickers so bad at the end there, I don't really think you can see my Pac-Man. Um, <laughs> No. All right, so do you have any idea how did it come to be that when Atari decided to release their their handheld console, they put a um, an independent, like an indie programmer's version of, of Pac-Man on there, like a homebrew? I I can't answer to that specifically, but I, I would venture to guess it came about due to two factors. The first is, um, even though a lot of people have kind of lightened up on Todd Fry's original port of Pac-Man to the 2600, it does still have that reputation as one of the worst games ever made, for better or worse. And, you know, if you read Arcade Perfect, he talks about a lot of the constraints he was other. And I, I, I believe that's when people have kind of eased up on him. You know, there was a lack of understanding back then. There was a lack of interviews and books like Arcade Perfect where you could kind of talk to someone and say, why did it turn out this way? Um, the second reason is... Uh, Overall, and you notice this with any console, games do get better as consoles go through their life cycle. And the reason is developers have a better handle on their hardware. I mean, you look at a game like God of War 1 on PS2 or The Last of Us on PS3, those games came out within the final months of their respective consoles. Those are games you probably wouldn't have been able to see earlier on because people just, you know, the developers just did not know the hardware well enough. So my guess for this scenario is that Atari either themselves or they hired someone to say, hey, since we know so much about the 2600, since it's 30 plus years in the past, let's put out a great version of Pac-Man. Even though as um, as a purist, I, I would probably prefer Todd Fry's. Otherwise, you feel like you're not really getting the same at-home experiences that people got in in the early 80s, but that's just me. Okay, fair enough. Um, and I guess it kind of depends on what you mean by a purist, because some people would argue they want the pure arcade experience, and they might Oops. feel like they might prefer this version. But, um, yeah, I get where right. you're coming from, totally. Yeah, and, and, you know, there are peripherals out there where you can get the, uh, the pure arcade experience of Pac-Man. So I feel like if you're buying an Atari device, you want Atari games, genuine Atari games on Yeah, but for sure. For There's sure. so many of those homebrew things out there now that you can find almost mm -hmm. anything. You want. I know, and it's so fun. It's crazy. It's it's like, hey, look what people can do to the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Look at these tricks that people have mastered. They, yeah. I guess there really was, cool. you know, one programmer figures out a way to do what, what you call talk about this in your book. They can copy a sprite and have multiple versions of the same sprite, and that's better than having the Atari trying to render multiple sprites. Um, so yes. once somebody learns that trick and anybody can copy it, then they can make better and better games. Yeah, that's something that Elsa has really uh, changed since then. You know, nowadays when you sign up to develop, you know, you pay a licensing fee to Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, whomever, they usually give you a software development kit. But back then, those didn't really exist. Um, and they didn't exist because, you know, Atari, for example, they didn't want anyone else outside of their studio to know how to do this. They certainly weren't going to help anybody. And so you had to figure this stuff out on your own. Nintendo is actually the same way, even through... The 16-bit era, you know, developers like Sculptured Software, uh, I talk about this in the book, they actually built and sold their own development kits for SNES games because Nintendo didn't want to help. Because even though Nintendo stood to make money off of third-party games, they also kind of had the mentality of, well, we're also encouraging people to compete because they might go buy Mortal Kombat instead of Super Mario World. So a lot of it was sink or swim yourself, but we're still going to cash the checks. Yeah, um, right. Nintendo has like competing interests, and it it put them in a weird spot. And I think they've gotten yeah. better about that since then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there's another challenge that some of these guys had to deal with, which is when they were making these ports, they weren't really ports because they were kind of having to code from scratch. You mentioned that a lot of these developers refused to give them the source code, or maybe they didn't even think to give it to them. Maybe if they had asked, they could have gotten it. I don't know. Um, how did it right. come to come about? Because that seems like an awful big challenge. Seems like, you know, they have one arm tied behind their back for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it almost seems to be a roll of the dice. Um, first of all, you know, I think Todd Fry for Pac-Man on Atari and Gary Kitchen, who converted Donkey Kong to the 2600, they both said that, in their opinion, the source code of their arcade games would have been worthless because, uh, A, the arcade hardware was so much more sophisticated, and B even though the games would have, were all written in assembly for arcade and home hardware during that time, 
there's so many different dialects dialects of assembly that had they gone through line by line, it might have taken them longer to translate it than it would to just kind of study the game, play it themselves for a little bit, and write their own code from scratch. Um, I think as consoles got better, though, as they got more powerful, there was more synergy between the arcade and home versions. So you have people like, you know, the teams at Sculptured and Probe, they had Mortal Kombat source code, and they did one-to-one translations of it in a lot of cases, which um, really meant that, you know, even though on Sega Genesis you only had uh, three buttons on the controller, four if you include start, if you ignore that, um, that version played almost identically to the arcade because they were working with the actual arcade code and just kind of translating it as they went. Right, right, exactly. So super fascinating stuff. Um, all right, now one part of your book, you mentioned that you saw Super Mario Brothers arcade machine, and then when you saw that Super Mario Brothers was out on home, you asked your mom, hey, we should buy this game, and if you give me this game, that means that's less quarters you have to give me when we go to the arcade. Right. At another part in the book, you were talking about what happens with the fighting games, which is uh, people would buy the home game, go home, sharpen their skills, get lots of practice in, then go to the arcade and spend their quarters, but they would really have a lot of skills to show off. Um, So which one of those do you think is more common when people buy the home game? Do you think that that would mean that they would spend less money in the arcades, or do you think they would spend more money in the arcades? I think they would spend less, but when they would go to arcades, they'd probably get more bang for their buck, or in this case, their tokens or or quarters. Um, I know that, you know, I play Mortal Kombat 3, for example, off and on in arcades, but when I had it for Super NES and I could play it every day, when I would go to the arcades, I did much, much better on two quarters than I had before I was able to play it for hours every day and, and learn everybody's moves and combos and so forth. Yeah, absolutely, because you have it at home, you can practice, you can learn all the patterns, you can... You know, like Kano says in the movie, I studied all your moves. Um, you could That's really right. go home and study all the moves, and when you went to the arcade, you were much better for it. Um, so, yeah, totally. I love it. I love it. Um, all right, there is another weird thing I wanted to ask you about. Uh, let me put this up on the screen here for everybody. Okay, so you know Disney has that movie, Wreck-It Ralph, and it was based on a fictional, non-existent game called Fix-It Felix Jr. Mm-hmm. Um, I was at an arcade the other day, and I actually saw a Fix-It Felix Jr. machine, and I took some photos of it. Um, That's crazy. Do you have any idea how something like that comes to be? I would imagine that since there's so much talent in the homebrew scene these days, a company like Disney Pixar can actually contact the program and artists probably internally Because uh, once upon a time, uh, Disney did have their own uh, internal development teams and said, hey, this is, it really, it's just, it's the same thing as if they would make an animated short or a t-shirt or a coffee mug. It's just another promotional tool to tie in with the movie. It is. It is. Um, There's also one of these little things. This is a little mini cabinet right here. Um, (laughs) I just think this is, and now true to what you talk about in your book, how they have to change it and it's not exactly like the arcade version. Even this thing is not 100% the same as what I played in the arcade. It's, it's right. kind of funny like that. Yeah. Um, all right. So I know that when in your book you mentioned that there are always these differences that occur uh, between when the arcade – when you play it in the arcade machine, when you play it on a home console, some differences have to occur. Um, and those don't always have to be a bad thing. Or, yes, maybe they do always have to be bad, but they can make up for it by trying to stuff something extra into the arcades. Um, yeah. What we like to do here is we really like to focus on the nitty-gritty details, the seemingly insignificant details of Mortal Kombat that seemingly nobody would care about. So let me ask you this. Do you have any idea how did it come to be that Sega Genesis got get over here and the Super Nintendo got come here? How did that happen? I'm talking about for Scorpion Spear now. So one thing to to keep in mind, um, and this is something I talk about more more in the Pac-Man chapter, is that for for a lot of these people, you know, working on these games, this was just a job. Despite Mortal Kombat being huge, it was just the next assignment on a lot of these guys' plates. And so, you know, audio, as I talk about, I think in the Mortal Kombat chapter, tends to be the first thing to go because you really need the graphics to match the arcade as closely as possible. Graphics and gameplay are kind of tied for first, and then everything else is tied for last. So I would imagine that, you know, Paul Carruthers working on the Genesis slash Mega Drive version and um, Jeff Peters and his team at Sculptured working on the SNES version, 
they probably just said, uh, come here, get over here. We don't need both. Or maybe we only have room for one. So let's just pick the one that we like. And they probably did, you know, to, to you and me and to everyone watching, both of those voice samples are iconic. Yeah. Uh, but to them, it might've just been another line or like, well, we can only have room for one. So I don't know, just pick one. Yeah. Um, all right. Now, John Tobias mentioned that in the book, you have a quote from him saying that he mm -hmm. actually worked with the development teams on the censored versions of the fatalities. Yeah. Which I thought was fascinating because, you know, we don't really, as Mortal Kombat fans, as gamers, we don't really see the behind the scenes process except when it's revealed to us, like through your book. Um, so that was right. kind of fascinating that John Tobias had some sort of uh, influence there and he was actually able to say, you know, do it like this or do it like that. Um, and yet, the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis versions had very different censored fatalities. The only thing where I think it was the same was with Kano's, where he, um, you know, pulls out their heart, but it's not like a beating heart. It's just like kind of a nondescript grayish block. And everything else, they had something completely different. Um, do you know right. how those particular differences might have emerged? Did that ever come up? Um, yeah, actually it did. You know, despite... Um these two companies, Probe and Sculpture, working on the same game, but different versions. They, you know, their owners, George Meadows over at Sculpture and Fergus uh, over at, at Probe, were kind of friends. They weren't talking every day about this, but um, they did, you know, collaborate on a few things. However, when it came to this, they really didn't talk to each other about, hey, should we make the same fatalities? Their teams, remember, deadlines were very tight. That's something I get into in almost every chapter. Yeah. Despite these games being heavyweights like Mortal Kombat and Pac-Man, uh, publishers didn't care. They just wanted to get the games out as fast as possible so they could start raking in those that money. Um, so Sculptured, in my opinion, put a little bit more effort into the Super Nintendo's fatalities. You know, on the one hand, Sub-Zero freezing someone and then shattering them into little blocks of ice is kind of silly. Like Mortal Kombat 3 fatality levels is silly. But it is more creative than just like uppercutting them. And but them you know, I actually thought that that freeze and shatter thing became iconic. Like, okay, they, they made it up for the censored version for the Super Nintendo, and yet that actually became his new fatality for Mortal Kombat 2. And even the yeah. freeze and shatter stuff makes its way into the movie. So I, I see what caused it. I see the need, the real world needs that made, that led to that fatality being born. And yet, that sort of became more identified with the character than his spine rip, believe it or not. Yeah, and um, that's true. And that's one thing Jeff Peters and I actually talked about. I don't remember if this quote made it into the book, but he said when, the, when we designed these new fatalities to replace the censored ones, we wanted to, we had to reuse animations because it's not like we could get the actors in and say, do a new animation for this fatality. They were done. Um, but they also wanted to make sure that the fatalities stuck to kind of the, the personality of the characters as much as possible. So Sub-Zero wouldn't just uppercut someone. He would do something with ice. And, and lo and behold, that's how his nest fatality came about. Yeah, I love that. And another one from that same port is Raiden, um, you know, where he electrocutes them. And instead of the person's head coming off, their whole body just turns into a pile of dust. And that, believe it or not, made it into the Raiden theme song that was released on the Mortal Kombat album. There's a line in the track mm -hmm. that says he turns his foes to a pile of dust. Yeah, that's probably more proof that the home versions were more played and more iconic than the arcade games. Because, you know, you go to an arcade and if you're there for 10 minutes, you play a game for a little bit, but the fine details are already slipping from your mind. Whereas if you're playing the game for hours at home, you tend to, that stands out in your memory more than something you just played for 10 minutes with two quarters one time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I thought that was really cool. And it, it really shows the importance of what the developers were working on, because they have to just, I don't know, they can't do what the arcades did, so they do something different. But whatever they do, <laughs> uh, millions and millions of people will see it and will come to identify yeah. those characters. So they really <laughs> right. took the time to treat it right, um, which I think is awesome. Um, all right, so obviously Mortal Kombat was in the background of what you're talking about in your book of, of these guys who have to take arcade games and port them to the home. We're seeing some changes. Mortal Kombat kind of caused a lot of those changes where they have to come up with the rating system. The whole birth of the ISDN um, or the IS, ESRB, excuse me. Yes. Now, before that even happened, Sega had their own rating system, at least here in the United States. I don't know if you can answer this, but I'm going to throw this on the screen now. Sega Genesis obviously had all the blood from the arcade, but locked away in a code. It was rated MA-13. 
mm-hmm. on the Sega CD version, the gore was unlockable from the very beginning, and it was rated MA-17, so four years older, obviously. Do you have any idea um, about the internal process at Sega for coming up with these ratings? Do you think they were aware of the hidden code that, that released all the violence? Or How did it come to be that one's a 13 and one's a 17, in your opinion? Um, the, their internal rating systems probably changed a bit. You know, once the ESRB came out, I, if you recall, I believe the Sega CD version came out after the four main yes. SKUs. Yes. Um, so that was, you know, the ESRB was out and Sega probably looked and said, oh, well, they're mature is 17. So let's, you know, let's, um, kind of coordinate on that. Oh, also, right, I see. So guidelines were now available, even if they weren't fully yeah. ready yet, they had different guidelines mm-hmm. to follow. So they were trying to get ahead of the game. That's my educated guess, but the second factor might be that, and again, I might be wrong here. I played it a few weeks ago, and it's I've already forgotten. I don't believe that the violence on Sega CD was hidden behind a code. No, so you're right. Probably, That's 100% true. Yeah, so there was probably more consideration of if some kid buys this, he's going to see all the blood right away versus if he doesn't know about the code, you know, he's safe from all, all of those violent fatalities. And so that's probably something else they took into consideration. <laughs> Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but let me pull this out here. Okay. Have you seen this thing before? Yes. Okay. The yeah. one, the little portable handheld by Basic Fun. Um, just for everybody yeah. in the audience who may not know, uh, this is based on the Sega Genesis or Sega Mega Drive port, but the blood has been removed. All the codes that could have activated it have been taken out. Um, did you have a chance to talk to anybody at Basic Fun about that or how that came to be? The funny thing is, so I, I only had, I, this book came about, I got the idea in March, uh, and by, you know, by July it was out in Story Bundle, so things happen really fast. They do. I also didn't want, like, I, as big a Mortal Kombat fan as I am, I could have done a Mortal Kombat book, um, but I kind of wanted to make sure I didn't give too much favoritism, show too much favoritism to one franchise. Um, I actually had an opportunity to talk with, if you remember a few years ago, there was a plug-and-play version of Mortal Kombat, the arcade port. Yes, that was by Jax with- Pacific, yes. Yes, yeah, by Jax. And the guy who programmed that was Chris Burke. I actually worked with Chris. Uh, I've actually written video games before, and he was uh, the lead programmer at a company whose game I wrote the script for. And he and I were going to talk about that. He also ported Mortal Kombat to Mac, but our schedules never lined up, so I didn't get to talk with him. That's probably something I would include if there were ever to be an expanded version or an ultimate arcade perfect edition of the book. That's probably an interview I would throw in there because I'm still fascinated. But about that one, I don't know. Uh, I'm not really sure. It might have had something to do with licensing. Uh, it's really funny because I, as you were turning it around, I saw the side, the Scorpion art is from Ultimate MK3. Yes. Uh, MK1. So that was, that's interesting too. It might be from someone who doesn't really know the property and they're like, oh, that guy, he's a yellow ninja. That's, that's no, no, that's not why. <laughs> All right, oh, I'll tell you. Is. I'll tell you, there is some inside deals. Um, there was okay. a lawsuit in the 90s between Master Daniel Pacina and Midway for them using oh, his likeness without their That's without right. his permission. Um, right. So when they made this, you know, they had to take him off the side. They didn't want to use his, his photo without their permission, and they didn't want to pay him anything extra for it either. In fact, if you look at my shirt, um, this yeah. is a great shirt. Oh, I right. love it. It's the Mortal Kombat arcade machine, but they had to take Dan Pacino off the side of this too. Um, so it feels incomplete. You know, I've, I've met him before in real life. Love the guy. Great dude. But that's just the way the cookie crumbles. He's he doesn't get to be part of this, you know. I wonder if it's a, a deal by deal basis because you know Arcade One Up was able to get the original artwork for their uh, three quarter size cabinet. So I wonder yeah. if um, I, I know that they they really try to focus on recreating the machines as much as they can. So it's funny. I interviewed their CEO for one of the interviews in Arcade Perfect, but. Mortal Kombat didn't come up past some glitches they had to work around, so maybe I'll have to ask about that because that's really interesting. It is, um, and you know they used they used the Mortal Kombat two art for for Arcade One Up, as you mentioned in the book, Carlos yeah. Piscina, who played Raiden. Now that's Daniel's brother, and right. he was not part of the lawsuit. He was actually offered a job, a full time job, as an artist. So he's still with the company. He's still with NetherRealm Studios today. Oh, that's um, cool. I didn't realize. Yeah. So the legal obstacles to using that side art um, are not there. Okay, that so makes sense. It's interesting. It, it, I don't know how Arcade One Up would have handled it if they'd wanted to go with the Mortal Kombat One side art instead of MK Two. I'm really not sure. 
Um, You mentioned something super interesting that I have to circle back to. I wasn't planning to talk about it, but now that you mentioned it, there's a Mac version of Mortal Kombat. Um, Dude, you got to get me some footage. Maybe I need to, I need to release that on this YouTube. Nobody's seen it before. You got to hook us up, man. Yeah, that would be, I'm interested in that as well. I actually had that game. So it's funny. I bought Mortal Kombat four or five times because every time. Me too. when, When it first. When it came out on Mortal Monday, the only platform I had that could play it was Game Boy. And that version was less than great. But it's all I had. So I got it. Then I got a Game Gear the following Christmas. I bought Mortal Kombat for that. And then I got a Super NES, got it for that. And then when I had a 386 PC, my uncle sent me the DOS version of Mortal Kombat, which is pretty darn close to Arcade Perfect. So I've always kind of wondered how the Mac version stacks up to that, and I'm, I'm really interested to see it myself. If you can get me a copy, I will be happy to play it on a Mac emulator, or if you can just get footage, I'll be happy. Either way, I would love to share that with the Mortal Kombat community. This is kind of why I started this channel, was to share Mortal Kombat uh, rarities with the rest of the Mortal Kombat community. So I would love it if you could come back and hook me up. Um, in the meantime, yeah, you cool. mentioned Jack Pacific. That was something I I really wanted to talk about. I also wanted to talk to you about Tiger Electronics because these guys, this is a Mortal Kombat Sub-Zero handheld, um, these guys were notorious for putting out tons and tons of handheld games and there was a huge market for it. Every time there was a hit game, they made theirs. Did you have a chance to talk to anybody at Tiger or I guess they're now Hasbro? I did not. I did not. Uh, Again, I wanted to focus on the SKUs that were as close to the arcade as possible, but yep. just different enough. The Tiger Electronics games tended to be, and I had a lot of those myself, they tended to be total abstractions because, you know, they could not get close to the, the arcade software. They're, they're nothing really alike. Um, in fact, this version, the game that I just displayed a minute ago, has a run yeah. button on it, and the run button is useless. It has no function. Wow. I, I, so I don't know how they managed to ship it like that. That's kind of yeah. shocking. Um, but look, I'm really glad you did this. I mean, ever since, I think, I want to say about 2004, um, when Mortal Kombat 1 shipped out on uh, on the Mortal Kombat Deception bonus disc and it, they used an emulator, ever since yeah. people could literally play the arcade ROM in their living room or, you know, play it on MAME on their computer and a little bit before that, people have kind yeah. of forgotten all about the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo. These are the ones that they grew up with. These are the ones that we're really nostalgic for, if we're being honest. These are the ones that we played over and over and over. Yeah, um, you know, one point I make in the book, I'm sorry to jump in, but yeah. I wanted to, to your opinion on something. Yeah. I actually prefer the Genesis version to the arcade version because, you know, the, the color palette was uh, less robust, but that made the game look grittier and grainier, and I actually thought that fit with Mortal Kombat's aesthetic really well. It always struck me as a much grittier game than, say, Street Fighter, which is kind of more of a cartoon. You know, and I'm going to be on the minority on this, but I really liked the Super Nintendo port of Mortal Kombat 1. Um, You mentioned some challenges that they had. Um, I think you mentioned that one of the programmers started, did it wrong, and then he was kicked out or he bailed, and then they had to start all over with almost no time. They had to scramble together and put it together, and they did it. And there's something about the Super Nintendo version that if you haven't played it, um, uh, guys in the chat... Basically, you can press a button and it doesn't appear to respond. Now, people are calling it the controls sluggish. People are calling it slow. But I'd say that's not the case. Because what happens is you can press back, back. Nobody will see that you're moving back. And then you can press low punch and just surprise them with a spear out of nowhere. This player two will never see it coming. It is amazing. And then when I... So I really focused on the Super Nintendo version hard. And I learned the ins and outs of it. And then when I started going to the arcades and I realized, hey... If I just hit back, even just the slightest little tap, my character moves back. That's not what I want. I just want to do the input for the move. I don't want him to actually move in that direction yet. I, I'd hold it down for longer if that's what I wanted. So the Super Nintendo, like if you start there, it's this weird thing where that becomes the right way to do it. Yeah, it's it's funny. Two points to that. First of all, I don't know if you did this, but as I as I tried to become an elite player... Uh, what I would do is I, I would tend to hold block all the time so that when I would do a move like back, back, low punch, they couldn't see which direction I was going to move. Kind of ex- obscured a little bit. Yes. Um, or do it on your way down from a jump. Like you jump and then hit back, back, and they won't know. It was really fun to do fatalities like Sub-Zero Spine Rip that way because you could land in a crouch and then the screen would darken and you'd immediately stand and do the, the Spine Rip. It was kind of cool. Yeah, um, it's awesome. Uh, the other the thing is, and I do discuss this in Arcade Perfect, uh, you're right. 
the character won't respond in terms of movement, but the input still registers it. But that's one of the problems they had. Ideally, it shouldn't work that way because that, that was an accident. Well, it was an accident. One thing you want as a player is when you're kind of in a zone, you're looking for how audio visuals sync up with the inputs. And that's one thing they couldn't really do. They had an internal table of animations and uh, input codes like back, back, low punch that they couldn't get to sync up. But, you know, anyone who's played Mortal Kombat 2 on Super Nintendo knows that definitely was not the case there. Right. And you mentioned that the process that they made, it was completely different. Um, I don't want to get too into it because, guys, you really should buy the book or, you know, stay stay to the end of the chat and see if you can win a copy. Uh, but if not, then go ahead and buy it using the address below. But um, it, was, it was the process that they coded Mortal Kombat 1 and 2, at least for the Super Nintendo, was completely different the way they brought it uh, to the right. home system. And they really nailed it on, on the second one. I got to give them props. They really did. Um, you also talk about the Game Boy port of Mortal Kombat 2, which, you know, to this day is still held up as the best Game Boy port of a Mortal Kombat game, period. Um, and I got to read the chapter, and I got to see the quotes from the guy who actually did it. Um, you know, one of the unsung heroes of Mortal Kombat, you kind of had a chance to tell his story, and that was great. Um, I wanted yeah. to say that yeah. one of the things you mentioned was they did the sprites as a background layer, and it, I guess it didn't flicker that way, because then they could do the fireballs, and then the fireballs would be fine. It was just, like, really cool the way they came up with these weird tricks to make things work. Yeah, and that's, again, that's one of the reasons I love uh, writing about games from that period. If you look at, like, today, Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection, which I do talk about, I think, in Chapter 10. Yep. That is a little bit more straightforward because, you know, modern consoles can run the game from 1991. No sweat, really. But back then, they had to jump through all sorts of hoops on fire to get games like Mortal Kombat to work. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and even Space Invaders, like you mentioned in the Game Boy Color, they had to do that same background trick. Yeah, yeah. And, if, you know, if they wouldn't have, it, you, you wouldn't have as many aliens in that, that grid of characters marching down. So it's not that they couldn't have done it, but it would have been less arcade perfect, and that's never the ideal. Right, right. No, so they came up with, with tricks to make it the best they possibly could, the best game they could make. Um, exactly. So you, you talked about the Game Boy Color port of Space Invaders. But a year or two earlier, they actually made one for the Super Game Boy. And I freaking love this port. Um, <laughs> somehow, they managed to take an entire Super Nintendo game and squeeze it into a Game Boy cartridge. And if you put it in the Super Game Boy, it will unlock and then switch modes and go into full Super Nintendo. Did you have a chance to talk to anybody about that and see how they did that? or Because they've never done it again. That No one's done that since. No, I did not. And one of the reasons was, because, again, because of my tight timeline, yeah. I, what I would do is I spent, I think, an entire day doing nothing but thinking about, okay, what games do I want to cover? What versions of games do I want to cover? I would send out as many feelers as I could. And by the end of the week, anyone who got back to me, I'm like, okay, this is my roster. This is it. Because I have to do these interviews and transcribe and write and rewrite and all that stuff. Yep. Um, it's something I would like to revisit. The other thing is... You know, a lot of uh, Nintendo platform games back then were done by Japanese developers. The language barrier is uh, an obvious problem. So there were games I'd love to talk about, but because they were made by Japanese developers, it's really hard to... to that get would be a little to... tricky, but I think you should just learn Japanese or something like that and do it, man. I should, I should do that. I yeah. definitely yeah, should. Get Rosetta Stone. I think they have they ported Rosetta Stone to the Game Boy, so... Well, there you go. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> speaking of Game Boy, Lone Wolf Productions says his first Mortal Kombat game was the god-awful Game Boy port of MK3. Um, yeah, that one was a little bit lackluster, coming hot off the heels of MK2. Um, you also talked to some people about the Game Boy Color port of Mortal Kombat 4 mm -hmm. in your book. I think that was incredible. Um, l let me ask you this. Mortal Kombat 4 seems like it was based on the Mortal Kombat 3 code. Is there any any truth to that? Because they use the same font, which is a very unusual font you never see. Yeah, there is some truth to that. A lot of it was retooled to accommodate 3D, which it was it was only nominally 3D because you could just kind of step in and out of the foreground and background. But yeah, uh, you can definitely see uh, MK3's influence there technically and uh, creatively. I actually, here's where I'm going to jump on a soapbox real quick. Mortal Kombat 4 is so underrated. I think people loved it back then, but they've soured on it over time. One reason for that is probably, you know, it was one of those early 3D games that just did not age well, like a lot of early 3D games didn't. But 
to me, Mortal Kombat was always, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, um, it was never really meant to compete directly with Street Fighter. I always considered it the poor man's fighting game, again, in a good way, because it was so accessible. You know, the fact that the characters all have the same set of basic moves meant that anyone could pick up a character and kind of get good at playing them. Mortal Kombat 3, to me, blocked that off a bit. You, if you were Sub-Zero and I was Sub-Zero, and you knew his six-hit combo and I didn't, I was probably going to get my ass kicked. I think you're uh, talking about high punch, high punch, low punch, low kick, high kick, back and high kick, but I don't know. Yeah, you are. But the, you know, the funny thing there is you probably know that in MK3, that combo did 3% less damage than the five-button version of that combo, which did 26. They fixed that in Ultimate MK3, but... You know, we we can get obscure if you want to get obscure. We'll I do. But, I love it. Yeah, we could totally do that. But um, you know, Mortal Kombat Four, the combo system was more dynamic. You know, there were certain combos that worked with everybody, and you could also kind of weave in your special moves and jumping juggle attacks in there. So this is just my my opportunity to say I love MK Four. Everybody should play MK Four. It was a great game. Perfect, perfect. Well, you know, we talked about the Street Fighter Mortal Kombat rivalry. In fact, I want to read a uh, quote from a guy named Ryu Kang. He blends them together. He says, I'm oh, Ryu wow. Kang. As you can guess, yeah. I'm a fan of both Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter. Uh, David, what was the rivalry between those two games like for you? Um, it, was a, it was a big thing. Mortal Kombat was probably my favorite subjectively. Objectively, I, I thought then and still think that mechanically Street Fighter 2 was a better game. It was deeper. But the problem there was, you know, if you played against someone who knew what they were doing, you had almost no chance, you know, like any Ken and Ryu player, I, I knew the corner trap, the Hadouken and the dragon punch, which just frustrated the hell out of my friends, but mortal Kombat, if they could figure out special moves. And then especially we played a ton of MK4. I mean, we'd pass controllers around for hours and hours. Uh, they kind of, they had fun being able to figure out their own combos. It was just a more accessible game. Um, so it was really interesting. I played both, but I definitely sunk a lot more time into mortal Kombat. One reason for that, there are, there are a couple um, first, I loved that, you know, as much as I like Street Fighter 2, Capcom made five of those. They felt like they were kind of spinning their wheels for a year, whereas almost every year, every other year, Midway was back with a new Mortal Kombat sequel. And I don't know about you, but one of my favorite things when I would see, like, catch a glimpse of Mortal Kombat 2, 3, etc., one of my first, the, the first things I would do was say, who's back? What do they look like? What moves do they have? Uh, I remember, you know, that first screenshot of MK was uh, Sonya facing Kano in the, the Versus Code screen. And I was like, oh, man, look at those graphics. Yes, and, the, and then and there the, was even, I know exactly what you're talking about, there's even yeah. a little caption underneath that said, what do these two have in common? Like, that just oh, stands right, out in right, my right, mind right. for no reason at yeah, all. But right. it's, it was awesome. Cool. Um, but it was also, like, I also, this is where, like, as a writer, I'm very interested in the difference between story or narrative and lore. I don't yes. think Mortal Kombat has ever had a great story, but the lore was fantastic because, uh, you know, from, from the intros and endings for each character to what happened before. Uh, I remember there's an FAQ going around. You probably read the same one that talked about the history for like thousands of years leading up to the first, well, the Mortal Kombat tournament that everyone first played. I may it have actually really helped, helped with a few fact checking things on that one. So that's cool. That's really cool because, you know, Street Fighter, like, I didn't care about Ken, Ryu, or Chun-Li past, like, what are their moves and what combos can I do? They, their stories didn't interest me at all, which is funny because, you know, a couple of years ago when there was an up for Street Fighter V not shipping with a story mode, I was like, uh, does anyone really care? Like, missing an arcade mode is more of a big deal to me because I want to practice against AI opponents. I don't really care what Ryu's motivation is besides I'm still looking for the best fight. But I wanted to know, like, when I, when I found out in Mortal Kombat 2 that I was playing a Sub-Zero's brother i was oh wow he's got a brother where's the original is he dead and then you know there was all that that rumors back in the day of is noob cybot really classic sub-zero and i think it came out that he he was you probably know more about that at this stage well, than the, I do. the midway guys love to take the rumors and turn them into reality and that's just one of the many mm -hmm. many examples you'll see of that happening yeah, that's actually one thing. You know, Mortal Kombat, when a lot of people think of it, they think of the blood and the gore. To me, Mortal Kombat has always been more synonymous with secrets. I loved the the buzz that would surround new Mortal Kombat games. When you even on the on the, the track screen for Ultimate MK three, you'd see this this purple ninja named Rain, like, Oh, who is that? It was just they would always give you those little glimpses. Of course, Rain wasn't even in that version, but it got people talking. And I yes. think that's something that's something the series has been able to do, even in the age of the internet, where things seem to be spoiled like two hours after something is brand new. There's still, like to this day, people are still finding secrets in Mortal Kombat games, and I think that is awesome. 
Yeah, well, one thing that kind of ruins the game for a lot of people are these leaks that come out where you know everything that's going to happen beforehand. But then what I like is that a bunch of people seemingly put out fake news also, you know, just fake leaks, stuff that's yeah. not even remotely true. And then you don't know right. what to believe. So then you say, all right, I'm just going to check out. And when it's ready, then I'll know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the way to go. I, I felt like the crypt idea was a good way to maintain that, although... I sometimes would use an FAQ because I didn't want to spend, you know, save up a lot of coins and then get like concept art or something. I think that's cool. But when it comes to unlockables, like I want fatalities, I want characters, I want outfits and stuff. But yeah, we could talk about this all day. Mortal Kombat is such a cool mythology. Yeah. Well, some of us would just, you know, keep playing over and over again and get unlimited coins and unlock everything in the crypt. So, there you, go. you know, whether it's going to be concept art or a new skin or background or whatever, um, yeah. we'll get it. We'll get it all eventually. Yes. But uh, what I, my strategy was to go for the expensive ones, because, you know, the expensive ones are going to be the cool ones. That's the good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So one thing I love, um, back going back to Mortal Kombat 1 on the Super Nintendo, big flaw with that version was that there was no blood. Um, it turns out that ROM hackers have actually fixed that. This is a special hack I have called Mortal Kombat Final Blood. So... Uh, I'm going to play a quick video clip of that in action. <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah, I like it. Win. Yeah. I like it. So I guess people have, you know, there was a Game Genie code floating around in all the gaming magazines at the time. Like, well, this is how you change the gray sweat and turn it into red blood. Um, then someone yeah. decided to just, you know, apply that Game Genie code and make it like that from the get-go. Um, right. right. Yeah. Have, yeah, you, ever, cool. have you, you ever seen that one before? Uh, no, I haven't. You can kind of tell that's what they did. They just replaced the gray sweat and turned it red because it doesn't, like, fly into the air and hit the ground. So it's really cool. It maintains that authenticness of the, the SNES ROM. That's really cool. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, okay, so switching tracks for a bit and going over to Arcade 1-Up. Uh, I loved the chapter in your book. It was in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles chapter where you really talked about the Arcade 1-Up and how they were going to bring that experience to the home. Oh, somebody in the chat just gave the Game Genie code out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at that. I think you know, he memorized also, it. In the chat, people were saying Team Deception or Armageddon. I'm Deception all the way. I had a lot of issues with Armageddon, but I think Deception was one of my favorite games in the franchise. I think Armageddon, the gameplay was a little bit too bouncy for me. Everybody kept going up in the air, and they were like, where you they would do tricks where you would like fall on the floor and, and then get up when you wanted to. Um, I liked, I do prefer the, the Deception gameplay overall, yeah. Uh, no, the hack does think, not have different fatalities, you know, because those are the same fatalities as in the Super Nintendo port. But, you know, there's always more ROM hackers and modders out there, so don't be surprised if a new version surfaces eventually where that stuff gets changed too. Very cool. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna be looking that up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I was saying the Arcade 1-Up, um, you, you had a chance to talk and sit down to the president of Arcade 1-Up and talk about his motivation for how he's getting all these machines out there, which I think is great. Um, right before the arcade one-up things became popular, my wife actually arranged for a MAME cabinet to be built for me. So I've got MK1, MK2, MK3, Ultimate MK3, and MK4, and even for some reason the PlayStation version of MK Trilogy, all thrown together on, on one mm. cabinet. It's full size. It has all the Ultimate MK3 artwork on it, six-button layout. I absolutely love this thing, and I love what arcade one-up is doing to make this available to the masses. Um, so you had a chance to talk to them uh, uh, pretty extensively, it looks like, right? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I was at E3 uh, for the past couple of years, or several years, I've been there on behalf of Shack News. And what we like to do is we do, we have a booth on the show floor. And I this year, um, I hosted, I was doing a lot of on-camera interviews because, you know, they know one thing I, I do really well is talk to developers and get them to tell their stories. Um, and so during, a, during each of my breaks, I would go, we were in... We were in West Hall. I'd go to South Hall and check out Arcade Perfect's booth. And then uh, before then, I'd been emailing back and forth with Scott Backward, the, the president of the company, saying, hey, could we talk? I'm writing this book. He, he said, man, this is really cool, but I just don't have time. So eventually, I just went over to the booth, and I found him. I, I knew what he looked like. I was like, Scott, hey, I'm the guy bugging you about a book. He's like, oh, cool, you're here. So we chatted for a little bit. 
And then after that, I arranged uh, a Skype interview with him. Uh, it's funny because that, that chapter, chapter nine, has proven to be one of the least popular in the book. A lot of people think it reads like a press release for Arcade 1-Up. That wasn't my intention at all. My, my intention was, and I think I, I, I tried to make this clear in the introduction, I was not only going to talk about ports, but also modern efforts by companies and brands like Arcade 1-Up to preserve arcade games in addition to port them. And so that was really why I was focusing on them um, cause I think, I also think they're doing a fantastic job. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's one of the coolest things. Um, you know, of course anybody can download MAME, anybody can buy a joystick, anyone can wire it up. And if you're, hum if you're happy with that, if that works for you, awesome. And if not, yeah. Arcade 1UP has another solution. There's a lot of different ways that retro gamers can experience their favorites. Um, another one yes. that you mentioned was, uh, Digital Eclipse, who you likened to the Criterion collection of video games. I freaking yes. love that. I love what they're doing, like the the new game modes that they add, the new ways that they have to preserve the old games, uh, but yet mm -hmm. let you experience them in a new way if that's what you want, and give you all this detailed backstory behind the scenes stuff that no one's ever seen before. I think what they're doing is awesome too, and you know it's hard not to sound like a press release for for these companies and these brands because you love video games and you're talking about your favorite video games and you're excited and you're genuinely passionate about what they're bringing to the table and what they offer us as gamers. Yeah, and you know, as a journalist, I, I always try to to give the good, the bad, and the ugly. I did talk about a lot of arcade one-ups issues. I talk about issues with all these ports, really. You have to. So, yeah. um, To be fair, yeah, I mean, yeah, you did you mention to. that like some of the ink was coming off of the, the things at one point. Yeah, yeah, you know, this was... That interested me because this was it started as a very small team. This was before the cabinets were widely available. And so I was curious, how would you handle something like this when you don't have hundreds of people to throw at a problem? And so, yeah, I'm just always interested to, to get cool stories out of people. Yeah, I thought it was great. Um, a lot of people have been asking me about this for some reason. I don't know why they thought I was the guy to go to. But now that you're here, let me just pass this question on to you. Uh, all right, so... Arcade 1UP has designed some Street Fighter cabinets. They put some Street Fighter games all in one cabinet. Then they designed some Marvel superheroes, including some X-Men games on one cabinet. Now, there's some people out there who think that maybe this is all leading up to putting out X-Men versus Street Fighter and Marvel versus Capcom on, on a cabinet together, but that would be incredibly difficult to do. Uh, what do you think? Is that something that could be possible? I, I can neither confirm nor deny that. You'd have to figure That's out That's the most the ultimate... exciting answer you can possibly give. Yeah, you'd have to figure out an ultimate combat code to, to get anyone to give that information up. Yeah, that makes sense. So we will not discuss <laughs> that anymore. Um, <laughs> but the idea that something like that might happen is definitely something that a lot of gamers, especially in the fighting game community, would be super excited about. However, sure. there are legal difficulties in getting the cooperation of both Marvel, who's now owned by Disney, and Capcom yeah. to kind of cooperate. And how do you split everything up? And how do you make it so that everybody's happy? But, I mean, um, that's, that problem has kind of plagued the, the Capcom versus series for years, if you think about it. Like, you know, yeah. those games, older games, even newer games have been on, available and then pulled, available and then pulled again. It, it might be um, really hard for the stars to align at this point, but it would be really cool if they could pull it off. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because that is another problem that has really been um, upsetting a lot of gamers is the fact that, like, a game comes out, you go and you, you buy it, and then, okay, it's yours, and your copy doesn't get erased, but the game gets pulled down and no one can buy it anymore, and then if your console gets destroyed, who knows what will happen if you need to get another one later. That's kind of yeah. your one chance. It's It really puts people in a bind, you know? It's, yeah. We don't like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that a problem you think might go away sometime soon, or what do you think can be done to solve that issue? I, I think that, you know, the emulation community, those folks are so dedicated. I feel like eventually you'll be able to play any game you want to play, even if, you know, you might have to uh, jump through some hoops to get it to work. You know, maybe it's not ideal. I don't think anybody really wants to be sitting at their desk playing MAME ROMs, you know, building a cabinet like your wife did for you would obviously be like the way to go. Official releases would be even better because the thing about piracy, whatever you think about downloading old ROMs, I think it's okay because the games are so old, you're not really hurting anybody. But, you know, I feel like people only pirate because it's, 
maybe the the easiest solution it would even it would be even easier to just buy a game on PSN or Steam or whatever because then you wouldn't have to figure out how to configure anything. You'd be able to just play. Yeah, you know, those uh, those services know. are great. They do make it super easy. But when things go yeah. wrong, oh boy. Um, and the one else that comes to mind is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Reshelled because I love the classic arcade Ninja Turtles game. And then they made the yeah. ultimate, like, an HD version of it that's 3D graphics, and it was awesome. Oh, yeah, but you can't get it anymore. Like, why? Why would yeah. they do that? Yeah. How, how does yeah, that even license. happen? I think that at that time, the Turtles property was changing hands from Ubisoft to Nickelodeon. Hmm. Uh, that That is my guess. Because, you know, if you look at uh, my favorite arcade game of all time is the original Ninja Turtles. And uh, if you look at the Xbox Live Arcade, as it was known back then, release of that, the, the borders on the screen showed the turtles as they appeared in the then upcoming TMNT in 2007. Um, and then, you know, that game got pulled for the same reason. Uh, that's one thing I talk about in the book. Scott and the Arcade 1UP team had to work with, you know, Konami, Nickelodeon, Ubisoft, everybody to get the rights because you can't just recreate a cabinet. You got to think about the, the artwork, the button layout, the game code. Yeah, there are all sorts of legal entanglements to kind of unwind there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Shinox just mentioned the Raw Thrills Ninja Turtles game, which is cool. Um, hopefully, one day, somebody will be able to emulate that or maybe give it a home port. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. Okay. Um, all right, so here's something that's been bugging me, and I guess it's been over an hour, so I guess we're getting ready to wind this down, but I did want to pick your brain about this thing. Uh, all right, so I didn't know about this because I guess it's kind of an obscure console that was or computer that was more popular in other countries. But you mentioned a clone of Missile Command called Missile Defense. And yeah. the idea that somebody can just take a game and then make the exact same game for another system and not even give the original dudes any um, credit or, you know, obviously work it out with them and give them, uh, license it out properly... The idea that that could, some, that could happen is just unimaginable, I think, today. Oh, it absolutely is. In fact, one thing I mentioned, uh, I dig into this even more in uh, Breakout, my book about Apple II games. Um, that was, you know, creating our clones of arcade games was how a lot of game programmers got their start. Because think about it. When you're learning how to program, it's much easier to just kind of recreate a game that's known versus learning how to program and coming up with a design all on your own. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people, like even Jordan Mechner, uh, who went on to make uh, Karataka and Prince of Persia, he got his start by making clones of games. One of the best-selling games on Apple II was Appleoids, which was just asteroids, but you were shooting the Apple logo instead of rocks. I mean, you know, and people made bank off those, but publishers did go to a point this is when the games industry was growing and people were starting to hire lawyers where the lawyers would say, ah, you can't, this is obviously a ripoff of my client's game. And, uh, you know, for better or worse, the industry, the industry changed there. Yes. Yes. And now I do feel like mobile games, which are kind of a new field, um, are kind of going through that same phase because if you look in at least in for Google and the play store, it, you can search for games and I swear to God, there's like three or four of them that are identical. And I don't know if it's the same company just, you know, disguising it. I don't know if people are just ripping each other off. Uh, I don't know what's happening. But you can go to the Play Store and find three or four variations, and it's just the same software. I don't know how that stuff gets passed. You know, it's funny. A lot of that was sanctioned, too. Uh, Gameloft, which I think they're still around. They're basic, they're Ubisoft's uh, mobile game branch. What Gameloft would do is they would take a really popular concept from consoles and kind of recreate it with a different name for mobile. Like, I don't, I don't remember what it's called, but I remember when I got my iPad in 2010, one of the first games I bought was a Gameloft game that was basically Resident Evil 4, but they had their own name for it. And they did that for a while. I, I don't even think that's a bad thing. Again, it's, it's, you see that in the industry today. I mean, Mortal Kombat came about because Street Fighter 2 was really popular. Yeah. You, just, you have to put your own spin on what you come up with. Let's see, I'm glad you mentioned that, and I want to circle back to that in a minute, because obviously Mortal Kombat's my favorite thing to talk about. But before we do, I just wanted to uh, look at my desktop here, because I wrote down a couple of these. All right, so there's like a game in the Play Store called Galaxy Invaders. Um, there's another one called Falcon Squad. There's another one called Alien Shooter. These are all, you know, for Android phones. Um, 
they're all like the exact same game. I swear, it's like the same mission, the same theme, the same controls, the same, you know, the, the graphics look a little bit different. And then everything else, it, says, it looks like one game is just a hack of another. It's crazy. It just reminds <laughs> me of the Missile Command, Missile Defense all over again. Yeah, and it's funny. A lot of people don't really care about mobile games because they figure, oh, it's just some free-to-play thing or it's just some 99-cent thing. Um, yeah, mo the mobile scene is really, really weird, man. I've done some writing for mobile games. It's it's weird. It's a yeah. weird scene. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, and I think, you know, over time, that's going to have to get cleaned up. It, it just has to, but we're not there yet. Right, right. It, it, it really... What happens, cleanups occur when a game really blows up and comes to the attention of a publisher who goes, uh, wait a second, that looks like our game, and then they kind of jump on it. Yes, exactly. Now, you mentioned that Mortal Kombat, um, and you talked about this in your book, too, that Mortal Kombat wanted to distinguish itself early on as, yes, it's a fighting game, but it's not a, a Street Fighter ripoff. Um, and I think mm -hmm. they did that very successfully because there are games that you can say, okay, that's a Street Fighter ripoff. But there's also games where you can say, hey, that's a Mortal Kombat ripoff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Eternal Champions definitely seemed like the closest thing to a Mortal Kombat clone from back in the day. Killer Instinct was kind of an interesting blend of, it had like Street Fighter depth gameplay with finishing moves that were just kind of really bizarre, but there was definitely a Mortal Kombat influence there. They even had, you know, Pit type fatalities where you could knock someone off of, I think it was Orchid's building and they'd like fall into a car on the street or something. See, what I liked about Killer Instinct is it was its own thing, but you could tell that, okay, the button yeah. layout is derived from Street Fighter. You could see that Mortal Kombat left its mark on it. But it's not like, oh, God, I just saw this terrible game the other day called Expect No Mercy. And, you know, there's another one out there called, um, it's on the 3DO, called Way of the Warrior. Like, you see these games and you say, okay, that's a clear Mortal Kombat ripoff. But um, most of these, most of the successful games, obviously, that's not a recipe for success. Most of the successful franchises mm -hmm. that are still around today got there by being different, by yeah. doing their own thing. Yeah, there's there's some secret sauce. I think a lot of the problems with that is that um, a lot of publishers looking to to cash in or create their own clone don't really completely understand what it works. Um, what, what, what makes a formula work? As an example, you know, again, stay well and listen books were my first kind of breakout hits. I've written a lot about Diablo, and there are all sorts of Diablo clones. And a lot of people figure, oh, well, what makes that game work is the loot system. That's not true. What makes that game really work, what makes it click, pun intended, is the feedback you get from clicking, from swinging and attacking and the accessibility of the games. You know, the loot system, that's like another, that's like a level or two deeper but a lot of action RPGs kind of come and go because they, they miss that really satisfying feedback you get from swinging and, and landing a hit on a monster. For sure, for sure. And that's what it's all about because gameplay is number one. Um, the graphics, you know, they come and go. Some of us are still fans of the old games despite the, the graphics might not all be there by today's standards, but the gameplay still is. That's, how, that's what makes these games hold up over time. Um, you know, that's how yes. you get... 11 sequels in uh you know or whatever we end up at so all right i guess we are getting ready to wind this thing down guys if you have any other questions you want to ask in the chat go ahead now's the time to do so i wanted to ask you david are you planning on doing an audiobook version um yes i am there's nothing concrete yet but like i i i, I can't remember if i said this to you off stream or at the beginning when we were live uh, I am talking with a publisher right now about possibly putting out a collector's edition hardcover because the book has garnered a lot of interest. And so I would probably go with that direction to uh, audiobook production. I don't know if it's something I would do myself or if I would hire a professional actor. But, you know, as of up until recently, I was very focused on getting the paperback and Kindle version out. But I, I do want to see or I guess hear this book in audio format eventually. Absolutely. Well, we're getting ready to do the giveaway. Um, I'm going to give you the instructions, guys, for that in just a sec. We do have one question first for you, David, from Jolly. He wants to know, who are your favorite characters? I don't know if he means Mortal Kombat characters or video game characters, so I'll let you answer in both ways. Katana. Oh, hey, hey yeah. look at that. I was, I was um, back in the day, I could play I could play random select and do really well. I, again, I sunk a lot of time in these games, as you did, and I'm sure most of your audience has. Um, but Katana, 
is Bay. She's end all be all, um, especially in, uh, in Mortal Kombat 2, 9, 10, and 11. I haven't gotten to play nearly as much of 11 as I would like, but in all those other games, especially 9 and 2, she was my go to. She never let me down. Mine was Shang Tsung for the very same reason that you like to pick random select. When you're Shang Tsung, you can be everybody, you can do the That's complete right. move set. Um, so, all right, well, let's go ahead and I'm going to give out the rules now to how you can participate for the giveaway. All you have to do is type in the chat what your favorite Mortal Kombat game is. So you type your favorite Mortal Kombat game and I will enter your name right now. All right, I'm going to switch over to, uh, the wheel of fortune as we like to call it. Here we go. And I have to edit people's names into the wheel right now. Ooh, MNSC, Mortal Kombat Deception. Bold choice. That's right. I like it. See, where's the, where's the love for Mortal Kombat 4, you guys? Come on now. Mortal Kombat 4 Revision 2. It was the peak <laughs> of the arcade. I really like the Road Tour edition of Mortal Kombat 4, to be honest. I played that one too, actually. I remember, I think that was version one, and like I beat it with Sub Zero, and there weren't even any endings yet, but I thought that was actually kind of charming. Oh, and you, you went to, like so you went to the Mortal Kombat 4 Road Tour too? Yeah, yeah. And then they also had uh, version one in my arcade, so I got to play it a couple times. Oh, cool. that's awesome. Yeah. When I, well, I did the Road Tour as well, and, you know, the crowds were just like a mile long, I swear. It was going out the door. So the idea of, of getting to play a one-player game and beat the ending, that was just not going to happen. Right. <laughs> All right, so I'm just typing up names. People who have um, answered what their favorite is, I'm putting them in the wheel right now, loading everybody up. All right. Bonus points if you choose Special Forces, because we'll just have to feel bad for you, I guess. Right. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's going to say that that's their favorite. No. All right. Well, it looks like I'm all caught up. So, in that case, let's go to the top. Apply wheel Charlie's change. Charlie's from the future. You've played Half-Life 3. I'm, I'm jelly. I think we're all jelly. Oh, I thought it was going to be Jasper. It's M-N-S-Z. Look at that. Okay, I need you to tell me what does M-N-S-Z stand for, and um, we're going to have to talk in private so I can get your details and send you a copy of the book. Congratulations, M-N-S-Z. Yes. Hope you like it. I do have a special message for you, M-N-S-Z. A winner is you. I'm sure we all know that meme from the NES Pro Wrestling video game. That's right. So, awesome, awesome. Um, the S, yeah, the SZ stands for Sub-Zero. Oh, Maxi New Sub-Zero. There we go, MNSZ. Um, all right, MNSZ, talk to me on Twitter. That's probably the easiest way you can reach me. If you don't have a Twitter, just tell me. We'll figure something else out. We'll arrange it. But I will get a copy. Um Rodney is asking if you can send a copy of your book to him in Malta, uh, a signed copy. Rodney, you might have to get with, with David in private and kind of arrange for that. Uh, yeah, Malta, if you want, give me a follow on Twitter at David L. Craddock, C-R-A-D-D-O-C-K. Um, I'd be happy to talk with you about getting um, a signed copy if you want. Okay, and I'm going to type that up in the chat, so you know all you have to do is click on it. Guys, if you didn't win the uh, contest, thank you for playing. Please go ahead and buy a copy of the book at the address below. That will really help me out as well as help David out. And um, I thank you again for, for being a part of this. I guess one last thing before we call it quits. What's next? What are your future plans? What else are you going to be writing? I think you have a couple of books um, down the road, right? I do. Uh, there's a story bundle coming out um, on October 30th. And one of the books of mine, the newer release that will be featured, uh, is Beneath the Starless Sky, which is a narrative-style story like Arcade Perfect about Baldur's Gate, Pillars of Eternity, and the Infinity Engine RPGs, uh, which was originally published on Shack News, and, and you can read it on shacknews.com right now if you want. 
Um, within the next couple months, Stay Wild and Listen Book 2, Heaven, Hell, and Secret Cow Levels will be available on Kindle. Paperback will follow sometime early next year. Uh, I have a publisher waiting for book three of a fantasy series, I'm working on that. And I'm also shopping around a lot of new stuff. So, um, yeah, there's I'm always working on at least two or three things at once. Right, that's how you got to do it. That's how you put out so much content. Great job. I just have one last question that I almost slipped my mind. Um, okay. All right, so Sculptured Software put out the Mortal Kombat 2 port for uh, Super Nintendo. And I know that yeah. they, they did a very good job copying the code line by line and making it all work. Somehow, Johnny Cage's default costume is red instead of blue like in the arcades. <laughs> Do you have any idea how that happened? I don't have any idea how that happened. It might have been an oversight. Something else I found that I actually took a screenshot of. Um, it, it's, so they did it line by line. There are probably some specific stuff that maybe they overlooked or didn't know about. If you choose Baraka, stand right up against another character and do down back high punch for his knife spark or blade spark, the spark will go right through them. It won't do any damage at all. Is that in the arcade version? No, it's not. It's not in any other version. I tested it on Genesis, SNES, and Arcade, and only on SNES does the spark go right through the character. Does I noticed the answer? exact same thing on the SNES port with Kung Lao. Yeah. His hat goes right through the character, oh, too. The, I'm wondering if that's... Like, if other projectiles work that way, we'll have to try that. Maybe the like Kang's fireball, scorpion spear. I know you have to be right up against them, so that's a move where, like we talked earlier, you probably want to hold block before you do the spear. But I do wonder if it would go right through them. It's just something interesting. There's a couple moves that are like that, for sure. Well, listen, this was great. This is the uh, author of Arcade Perfect, how Mortal Kombat, Pac-Man, and other coin-op classics invaded your living room. David, thank you again for your time. Do you have anything else you'd like to plug before we pull the plug here? Uh, no, just give me a follow on Twitter at David O'Craddock. And uh, thank you very much for having me. This was a lot of fun. I enjoyed getting to interact with your audience and talking with you as well. So thank you very much. Hey, thanks again. The pleasure was all mine. Guys, thank you very much for being here. We will see you at the next video. Take it easy.